Hello and welcome to this edition of Hack Naked TV for September 11th, 2015. I'm your host, Bo Bullock, and this week we're going to talk about cracking the passwords from the Ashley Madison dump. We're going to talk about uh, new vulnerabilities in FireEye that were disclosed. Uh, we're also going to talk about some Android rant somewhere, and I'm going to give a quick demo on PowerShell Empire. As always, Hack Naked TV is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. If you're in the need of a penetration test, vulnerability assessment, or any other type of security assessment for that matter, contact Black Hills InfoSec by sending an email over to consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com. And by Cybery.it, get the latest hacking and security training for free from www.cybery.it. All right, so cracking Ashley Madison passwords. So um, up until very recently, um, not many people have cracked a whole lot of the Ashley Madison passwords, um, and that's due to the actual passwords of each user being stored uh, via a bcrypt hash. Um, bcrypt hashing is, is a fairly robust hashing algorithm that takes a very long time to try to crack. Um, so a group called Sinosure Prime has came out and said that they've cracked 11.2 million passwords from the from the breach. So how have they cracked so many if everyone else is having such an issue cracking these bcrypt hashes? Well, Sinosure found a, a vulnerability in the actual code that was released along with this dump. Um, the code basically pointed to um, another set of, of tokens that were stored in the database as well um, that also included users' passwords. Uh, this particular token, um, Basically, it was an MD5 hash of uh, the user's username and their password after being converted to lowercase and then concatenated together. So basically, it's an MD5. Um, they they then basically just started cracking these MD5s. Um, and the result is that MD5s are, uh, they, they take a lot less time to crack than the bcrypt hashing function. So they were able to crack a lot more a lot faster. So within the last 10 days, they've cracked 11.2 million of them. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is, is like once they've cracked these lowercase versions of the username and password, um, they then have to go about converting, reconverting this back into um, the actual user's passwords. How are they doing that? Uh, basically, they're taking the bcrypt hash uh, from all the bcrypt hashes that they dumped. They're taking the cracked MD5s, and then they're taking and basically modulating each of those passwords that they cracked um, one letter at a time um, and converting them to uppercase to see if any of those match the bcrypt hash. Uh, so basically they've got their, their new password list of passwords that they know are in the, in the database and the, and the bcrypt hashes, um, and then just running them through like a mangling algorithm to uh, essentially modulate each character. So something like, like if they cracked a password that was like password123 that was all lowercase, right? Um, if they wanted to find out if that password really was like P with a capital A, they just start working one letter at a time and um, uppercasing each one. and then. Uh, when they get a match, it's going to match the bcrypt hash and um, take a lot less time. So basically, uh, yeah, so they were able to crack a ton more. And so over the next like four or five days, they say they're going to crack into the four million. So I would expect we're going to have uh, a new uh, password list called ashleymadison.txt to use in our password cracking within uh, the next few days. So something to look out for. Um, <clears throat> a, a security researcher from ERNW disclosed uh, responsibly some new details on some vulnerabilities in FireEye. Uh, so as you know, FireEye is a uh, pretty large uh, security vendor. Um, and they provide a product that does uh, basically like sandbox malware explosion. So um, you know, if, if somebody sends like a PDF into an organization, they analyze that PDF before it actually hits the, the organization's network and whatnot. Um, this particular vulnerability or this set of vulnerabilities that this security researcher disclosed were in the actual uh, software itself of, of the FireEye uh, box. Um, basically, through the administrative console in the FireEye system, um, an attacker had the ability to upload a, a cert, right? Like, so if, first off, somebody would have to have administrative access to that system, right? So they'd have to have creds of an admin to get access to it anyway. So um, <clears throat> that's that's a whole different story. But basically, this particular vulnerability was a, a command injection through an uploaded cert. So somebody could upload a cert, inject commands, gain a shell to the system. Uh, through that means. And then uh, there was also a local privilege escalation uh, vulnerability that he was able to exploit to gain root pr privileges on the device. So uh, these particular vulnerabilities are, are really not that um, amazing or important. Um, the the big, bigger thing here is that uh, yet again, we have another security vendor uh, that is having major issues with security researchers disclosing these types of vulnerabilities. And in our community, we've got we've got such a huge uh, group of researchers that are constantly looking for bugs in various types of technologies. 
um, if they disclose responsibly to the company, um, th the companies need to be held held liable to fix those those vulnerabilities. So um, the thing here with FireEye is they decided they're going to try to take legal action against these security researchers um, when they reported this vulnerability five months ago. Um, so I, I think that this needs to probably stop in the near future. Uh, we need we need to have vendors that are working more with our researchers in the community and saying, hey, thank you for bringing that that vulnerability to me so that all of my you know, customers' uh, systems that I, I sell to them don't get popped because of some vulnerability that was, you know, pretty easy for you to find. So, um, anyways, that's just, it's it's brutal to see another another vendor that's, once again, threatening legal action against a security researcher for reporting a vulnerability responsibly. <clears throat> Android ransomware. So, uh, just like the ransomware that we've talked about many times that happens to your 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 standard computer system like a laptop or desktop um, is now being found on mobile phones uh, specifically android devices um, this new version of, of ransomware basically locks your screen on your android device so you can't gain access to it and then request payment something like five hundred dollars uh, the the thing that's interesting about this particular uh, ransomware is that it it tricks the user into granting this malicious app uh, admin privileges by overlaying an actual admin prompt with another screen that basically looks like an update. So the user sees like update OS and they click, okay, I'm gonna update my OS. But in the background, they're really clicking um, grant admin rights to this malicious app to install itself. And once that happens, it can completely control the phone, lock it, and then request payment. So right now the only solution to to fix that is to factory reset, but um, you know it's just it's it's getting to the point where we're seeing more things move towards mobile now. Um, so we're gonna have to start looking a lot more at protecting our mobile devices. PowerShell Empire. So uh, last Hack Naked episode, I discussed that I was gonna give a quick demo on PowerShell Empire. So this is it. I'm going to um, walk through uh, some of the the basic functions of it. I'm not gonna get too deep, but um, PowerShell Empire is awesome. I have. Been able to uh, play with it for quite a quite a bit now, and um, I'm really liking it a lot. Um, basically, PowerShell Empire is it's a pen test framework. I I would kind of say that it, if if you were to describe it like anything, I would say it's it's closer to like a Metasploit type of framework where you've got um, various payloads and handlers, um, and you've got multiple post exploitation modules. So you've got your handler system that's going to be your listener on like your command and control box and whatnot. You've got your launchers that you use as essentially like a means of um, connecting your, your, your victim client back to your, your server. And then you've got multiple modules to do pivoting, uh, you know, cred, uh, cred dumping, um, key logging and whatnot. So let's jump right in. So PowerShell empire, I'm going to go ahead and boot up empire so when you're sitting at empire this is this is the main console here um there's all you know there's a nice help menu um so the the primary thing you, you're going to want to try to do first is set up a listener so if you type listeners you can see we don't have any current um listeners active but it drops you into the listeners sub menu so um just typing info here we can see some of the options that we have uh for this specific listener um, you can give it a name, so you can have multiple listeners and name them different things. Uh, here's where you would you would specify your host. So if you wanted to actually specify um, a separate um, you know URL for it to connect back to, you could here. Um, and then basically you just once you're once you have your settings that you want with the listener itself, you just type execute. And now we have a listener on port 80. So if we list, we can see that we've got a listener on port 8080 on our system. Um, so that's pretty simple in itself, right? Um, the next next thing we're going to want to do is to use a stager to um, basically uh, launch on our system. So to, to launch on our victim client. If you do just use, use stager, tab, tab, you get a quick little list of the various stagers you have access to. Um, the one we're going to look at today is just the launcher because it's a pretty basic, uh, pretty basic um, stager. So if you do use stager launcher, um, and then let's share some info info there. We can set our listener to our test listener, which you can see we have the name up here of test. So we set our listener to um, 
if I can spell listener right, listener to test, um, and then basically just generate. And this is our this is now our payload to to launch on that system. So I mean, as you can imagine, this type of thing could be you know embedded in like a macro for a word document or whatnot. But um, what we're gonna do is just straight up launch it from the command line. So we've got our we've got our listener set, we've got our uh, our launcher now. Let's go over to our victim host and paste it in here. It's just a PowerShell command, um, an encoded PowerShell command. Run it. Come back over to our uh, our C2 box, and we should get a hit. Yep. So here it is. So you get this initial agent from that IP address is now active. Cool. So now we have agents, right? So this is the third part. So you've got launchers, you've got stagers, and then you have agents. So if we look at um, our agents, we can see that we've got this guy here. Here's the IP. Um, here's the username that it's logged in as, our Odin user. Um, and it's living in a PowerShell process. So if we copy the agent uh, name and we do interact with agent, now we are in the agent submenu. So this essentially is like your um, your you know your meterpreter module of sorts. So like if you were to use like sessions dash i uh, whatever session number for meterpreter. Now like this is you're you're in that session so to speak with that agent. Um, so when you're in the session, you've got a number of options too. Um, you can see just some basic info on the session itself. Um, you know, once again, you can type help for, for more options here. Um, you can see that we've got a lot more options once we're living in the actual process. Things like Mimikatz, um, we can just do a straight up shell if you want. Um, or you can jump right into using some post exploitation modules. If you just you do use module tab tab, you can see we've got a ton of other modules here to work with now. Um, so, um, some interesting ones, collection key logger, right? So if we do use module collection key logger, um, let's show our, our info here. You see that it's, it's set to run on the, this, the, the agent that we have set up here. Um, and then basically execute again. And now the key logger module is gonna run in the background. See, job started. So now um, we can jump back over to our Windows box. So like we can see that um, this system is actually key logging now. Mwahaha. If we come back over here, we can see the various keys being reported to our command and control system. So very neat. but. Uh, you know, from a post exploitation perspective, I mean, you've got you got all the various pivoting tools you would want. You've got PS Exec, you got WMI, um, you've got Mimikatz, uh, Pass the Hash. There's just a, a ton of functionality in PowerShell Empire, and it's only going to grow. And it's all in PowerShell, which is beautiful. You don't have to drop any executables to disk. Um, it's just it's an awesome, awesome framework, and I'm going to be uh, using it a lot from now on. So um, definitely something to check out if you're into pen testing or if you just want to. Uh, check it out within your environment to see if anything, uh, you know, from a defensive standpoint will detect this type of activity. Well, that's it for this edition of Hack Naked TV. Um, you can watch more Hack Naked TV at hacknaked.tv. You can check check out Security Weekly at blip.tv slash Security Weekly. Uh, you can check out the show notes for both shows at uh, wiki.securityweekly.com. And you can email me at uh, the show at hacknaked.tv. And you can catch me on Twitter at DaftHack. Have a great weekend. Talk to you later.